Welcome everybody to the second edition of Unpacking Software from Chocolatey Software. On the third Thursday of each month at 5 p.m. UTC, we will be live chatting about the latest news and opinion on the world of software focusing on packaging, software deployment, and lifecycle management. We have another live stream on the first Thursday of each month called Product Spotlight. That's where we spotlight chocolatey products, discuss releases, highlight features, and walk through tutorials and demos of our products. If you want to be notified of upcoming uh, chocolate content, any of it, uh, join us in our community hub on Discord, subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Twitter or X, Mastodon, LinkedIn, Facebook, Blue Sky and Twitch. We're on all the things and you can find all of those links on our homepage, chocolatey.org. Scroll all the way to the bottom or in the description of wherever you found this content. We want to make sure we hear from you about the content that we're producing. Is it what you want to hear? And do you have any ideas about what you'd like to see? Something different? Uh, do you want to see more demos? Do you want to uh, see more of these types of, of live streams? What do you want to see? Just let us know and have your say at uh, ch0.co slash stream survey. That's ch0.co slash stream survey. And again, wherever you found this content, that link will be in the description. Uh, my name is Paul Broadwith and I'm the Technical Engineering Manager here at Chocolatey Software and today I'm joined by Gary Ewan Park and James Ruskin. Let me bring them on stream. Gary, do you want to introduce Hi. yourself first? Yes, uh, my name is uh, Gary Ewan Park. I am a Principal Software Engineer here at Chocolatey. Uh, I am responsible for uh, lots of things. Uh, mainly focusing on the core chocolatey products, uh, so chocolatey CLI, chocolatey GUI, etc. Uh, so what, what I've always said is, if there's anything wrong with it, it's probably my fault. So feel free to uh, reach out and discuss. Cool. Okay. Thanks, Gary. We'll pop your email, personal email, onto the stream there, and everybody can bombard you with those emails. Um, we're also joined today by James Ruskin. James, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure, I'm James Ruskin. Uh, I'm a senior solutions engineer. I think I got my title wrong last time I was on the stream, so I'm being careful to get that one right here. Um, uh, chocolate software, and uh, yeah, I, I guess um, according to what Stevie might describe my job as, I um, automate things and, and have fun. Actually, maybe that's me who says I have fun. I think it is. What, what, I'm interested what you said your title was last stream. I can't remember, but somebody called me out on it, and uh, okay. I think I said senior software engineer, which... Gary okay. would frown at me for. It's not something like international football no. or, or... I've not gone back to check. Just... No. Okay, okay. That's cool. That's cool. At least it was approximating. Yeah. Um, awesome. Okay, so as, you know, as I said at the beginning, we're going to pick up on some software news um, that's happened in the last month. So the last uh, stream that we had was around about a month ago. Um, and the first one we're going to pick up today is kind of all over the place. Um, a lot of people are talking about it, and it's something that just keeps going on and on, and it's about Broadcom acquiring VMware. Now, they did acquire them some time ago, but this all keeps continuing and rolling on and rolling on. Um, but this time we're talking about uh, VMware's free hypervisor, ESXi, and we had a quick chat just before the show, and uh, all of us have used this. Um, this was my kind of first big introduction to ESXi. I'd used the Microsoft products before that. I think it was a uh, virtual, uh, Microsoft virtual server thing it was. And there was a virtual PC or virtual, well, I can't remember what the other one was, virtual watch. There was two anyway, and that was my kind of very first. But the proper one was ESXi. And it's really disappointing that it's it's vanished. A lot of people get into virtualization through using that. James, did you, uh, did you what, what's your experience of using that? Uh, back in my first, um, yeah, when I was when I was just starting out working in IT, I uh, I was you know, running ESXi to try and um, have a home lab, as as far as I could call it that at the time. It was obviously just you know old underused computers before I started getting really into the stuff. Um, and yeah, it's 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 a real shame that they're taking away what is essentially a fantastic learning resource for people to to try and figure out. Um, you know, obviously not in terms of huge clustering or anything like that, but just um, just a good virtualization platform. And it's gone, um, which, yeah, it's just a bit sad. Mm. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it was a big entry into using VMware products as well. I think for yeah. for them, I mean, if you've trained up on ESXi at home in your home lab and you go on to a job, then that's you've got to take that knowledge and then go and encourage them to purchase that because that's what you're familiar with. It seems, I don't know, short-sighted to remove it. 
Yeah, similar deal to you know Microsoft and Adobe making so many uh, products available to students at, if not reasonable prices, downright free. Um, it, it's it's a great uh, kind of spreading your your product opportunity, and um, it's surprising to me that any company doesn't want to do that. Yeah, Gary, you've used the SXI as well. You were saying earlier. Yeah, I mean, back in the day when I did stuff that wasn't just purely software related, uh, I got to play with some of this stuff because they didn't know how bad I was at it. Um, but in a old job, uh, we had a local kind of in, in-house IT department um, and I was able to work with them. And one of the things we wanted to do was have a server rack that had ESXi on it uh, for playing with because we had other VMs that were maintained over here by like corporate IT and we're like we don't want to talk to them people so we had our own little lab in the in the office um so it was great i mean it, it did what it did i mean it my experience with it was it just worked i mean obviously as you got into the higher um skews of ESX you got sans and different things and redundancies and all that sort of stuff but if you were just wanting to kick uh, spin up a couple of quick vms i mean my experience was it just worked I mean, there was obviously the restrictions on it. It only worked with certain hardware. Um, you can only do certain things. But for the spinning up of a, a quick VM and throwing it away, I mean, it just worked. Um, so as you said, Paul, it was a nice kind of gateway into the things that you could do once you went up the SKUs to get to the higher levels and you're paying for all the extra things. So, yeah, it's like I say, it seems a little bit short-sighted in terms of allowing people to tinker with it, play with it, and figure out what it does. So... Yeah, it's sad to see what it'll be, or rather, on the side, it'll be interesting to see what kind of comes in to fill that gap and what kind of takes over, if you like. One of the, the things that was mentioned in the, the articles, which again we'll link to, um, was that there is no replacement product. So VMware is you know, removing the ESXi, um, but they're not actually replacing them with anything. So, so I mean, it's like what what will come to fill oh, the void? Oh, um, so not, not from not VMware, from Broadcom or, yeah. or VMware, but more what will people naturally migrate to? Is there another? I mean, James, I've heard it. From, I've never used it, but I've heard it from James. I've heard it from uh, other people. Proxmox does stuff. I don't know if it does enough of the stuff the ESXi does. Uh, like I say, that's not my ballpark anymore. But what is going to come in to fill the void that ESXi not being there? Um, is, is leaving. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Some of the uh, Reddit threads as well that I've been reading, um, as James kind of said earlier on, that the people are saying that's where they're moving to. Now, obviously, Reddit's a bubble, like all of these IT things mm. are a bubble, and enterprises are a whole different uh, kettle of fish. But um, smaller companies and, and you know, it's smaller, smaller scale projects, Proxmox sounds like the option that a lot of people are going to be moving to. James, you you know, as Gary said, you've got, it sounds like you've got a little bit of experience with that. Um, is that a viable alternative? Yeah, I migrated some of my home lab stuff over to Proxmox recently, and it was um, pretty darn easy. Honestly, it was easier to get um, Proxmox running on some of the hardware I've got than it was to get ESXi running, uh, ESXi 7 at least, which mm -hmm. had locked down a couple of things, particularly around uh, some of the network cards I have. Um, so yeah, that, that seemed easy. Um, I, I had a good time. Um, I had fun. Yeah. And what can I say? He <laughs> finds fun and everything. Um, but it, it does call into question a little bit about other products like, you know, VMware workstations. I use quite a lot yeah. um, just because it's easy, it's convenient, and it just works. Uh, but there was, there's been talk for quite a while about that going away. Um, I think uh, I think it was a version... 15 or something they get rid of a lot of the team that maintained um this is before broadcom they get rid of a lot of the team that maintained vmware workstation and there was a bit of a uh you know a lot of questions being asked about what's the future um and then they continue to maintain it but again maybe we're going to go back there and this time broadcom sounds like it's going to be using a, a hammer as opposed to mm. you know what was done with vmware where they brought the team back i, I, I get the impression broadcom will just go no that's it, it's dead go and try something else and move on uh, so it does call into question other products as well, which I think is is uh, disappointing because uh, they had some really powerful products, you know, yeah. workstations, I said. Um, but one of the things that the CEO had said, they, 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 or he'd acknowledged that there was some unease around about the changes that are being made, but the subscription model that Broadcom has moved to with VMware uh, seems to be the, the industry norm now. Um, and while I kind of agree, that it is the industry norm. I don't think that's a good thing. Um, 
subscriptions for everything is just a way of of continuing that revenue stream. HP is quite strong in saying that as well with our printers and the ink that this is now a, it's a revenue stream. We're not selling printers anymore. We're selling subscriptions. Um, and that's where their money is coming from. So it's all motivated by profit to try and squeeze every last penny out of, of the products that we can. Um, and I think that's disappointing, especially with large organisations that can't migrate. Mm. Um, so, I was, yeah. It's no, quite, unre quite unrelated, but uh, I did see a headline recently that suggested that Audi was um, bringing a lot of features under subscription, e.g. cruise control and uh, heated seats. So, um, um, full beam headlights? Was feel something quite grumbly inside. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, it's but, yeah. Air conditioning. Um, yeah, lots of it's like. Well, if you want to go below eighteen, then yes. But I mean, above eighteen, it's fine. Yeah, it was, it was. Someone did say foam beam headlights, and I thought, no, they're surely a legal requirement. That's that's maybe someone going overboard. But yeah, um, that's I've read quite a few of these. Um, again, it was yeah. I think it was Reddit or Lemmy. I was reading yeah. about that stuff. Not the first car company to do it, but just one I saw recently. And yeah, but it seems to be going to the extreme. There's a, they used to sell subscriptions to the, I can't remember the name of it, but the service where if you had an accident or you'd broken down, you could push a button and you would get, um, you know, some sort of assistance. I can't remember what that was called. That was fine. You could understand a subscription for that. Yeah, for sure. But for air conditioning and heated seats, yeah. it's a little, yeah, it's a little ridiculous. It's quite hot today as I'm driving down the motorway. <laughs> oh, I'll just the one start thing. a subscription to air I'm conditioning sorry. for my car. That'll be nine dollars <laughs> ninety nine a month, please, uh, in order to cool down. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I've even heard, uh, for example, Tesla. I think um, sell an, an entertainment package that allows you to connect your phone via Bluetooth. I think that's too much, personally. <laughs> that's me. It's just. I wonder if the the heated part as well, where they're, they're trying to sell you that subscription, the windows suddenly stop working. No, you can't put the windows down either in a hot day. It's a security feature. Okay, we're but safety. Safety Sounds first. Like you. Um, yes. So anyway, we've talked about odd common <laughs> subscriptions. Um, let's move on to, there's another one as well, which was a bit of a, a, a I suppose maybe not a surprise as it happened before, I think. But Avast were fined $16.5 million for privacy software that actually sold the users' browsing data. I think that's a bit of a surprise from a security company that's actually tracking its users and um, selling their data to other companies. James, I know you've looked at this quite a lot. So yeah, it's yeah. It, honestly quite a, quite an ick factor. I know a lot of people who used to use Avast and um, yeah, the, the the fact that they you know acquired a company, um, sorry, didn't rename it, but then essentially used that company to sell off data that they were gathering, um, it's it's bonkers. Uh, I, I and yeah, particularly given their standpoint on hey, why not uh, you know keep your data safe from other people? Um, yeah, we'll keep it safe for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's put we'll it in this you. this box over here yes. we'll, uh, that we have the key to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's 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 bad. It's it's. It's not great. Um, obviously, it, it's kind of interesting that the FTC did get, did get involved after the initial kind of release of, of reports of this stuff from various uh, magazines. I think PC Mag and uh, Motherboard um, did a, a fun report on that. And uh, and yeah, then, then they just sold off a bunch of info, apparently. Um, and then, then gave us a really, really awkwardly stilted quote about how um, they were committed to their mission of protecting your data. And... Uh, <sighs> doesn't feel good does it it no. doesn't it doesn't i mean it does but i mean there's an element of are we really surprised anymore i mean i'm i'm subscribed to troy hunt's uh, hmm. have i been pwned website so every so often you get an email from troy saying you're included in a data breach and it's just <laughs> It's going to happen, but that's not the right attitude either. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad that the FTC is getting involved and there is going to be some ramifications from this. But at the same time, all of our data is out there already. I mean, it's... I, I, I think a lot of the, the breaches are different, though, because, you know, you've got a company who are trying to protect your data well, true, and they get true. breached, yes. whereas um, yeah. Avast are trying to protect your data by letting you no. put it into a box that's got a hole on the back that they take that's it out fair. of and give it to someone else. <laughs> Um, so it's you know, I mean, they're it, feeding it, the beaches, I mean, they're keeping yeah. Troy in business, is what they're doing. Let's, <laughs> let's be honest. So, it's, but no, you're right. I mean, it is, it is slightly different, but I guess what I'm saying is that there's no you can't assume privacy on anything anymore. I mean, it's just our data is out there, it's anyone can get what they, what they need, sort of thing. I'm in, a, I'm in a state where I'm just not surprised by any of this anymore, which is a sad place to be, really. 
Um, but yeah. And that's yeah, a great time to take a save to our sponsor, Choco VPN. <laughs> <laughs> but one of one of the quotes that was made um, that the FTC had said, I mean, they've banned, the, I'm just reading from over here, they've banned the banned of us from selling user data for advertising purposes. <laughs> and for years, the Ant Virus software company harvests the information from users' web browsers without their consent. And that included data on religious beliefs, health concerns, political views, locations, and financial status. And then they stored this information indefinitely and sold it to over 100 third parties with the knowledge of customers, the complainant says. I mean, that's... Okay, they actually had an advertising arm jump shot, it's called, in 2020. Yeah. They, they closed it down after, the, you know, the reports that you mentioned, James, from PC Mag and Motherboard came to light. It's like, oh, no, we've been caught. Let's shut it down. That's all okay now. Mm. Well, no, yeah. it's too late. You've, you've been doing it for years at that point. Um, I just find it really disappointing that these people are supposed to be protecting data. And that's that, and for people, I mean, we're obviously technical people. People watching this will probably be quite technical as well. Um, they're aware of kind of, you know, we're all aware of what goes on. As you said, Gary, you don't really expect the privacy these days. But you've got people who don't are not technical, who don't know this. Maybe sure. our parents or our friends. or And they're getting caught by this because they don't know what these companies are like. And Avast is claiming that it's a antivirus company and it's there to protect users' data. And then this goes on in the background. You know, and these are not allegations. The FTC have said that this is what's happened. Um, and unfortunately, and I'm going to read this particular bit out because these particular statements really grate on me. But the, the response is uh, from Avast was that they are committed to their mission of protecting and empowering people's digital lives. Um, the Avast spokesperson, Jess, I think it's Moni, said in a statement, um, and while they disagree with the FTC's allegations and characterizations of the fact, they're pleased to resolve the matter and look forward to continue to serve our millions of customers from around the world. So there we've put both sides. Um, I've asked, have said their piece, the FTC have said their piece, but um, I find the whole of it, it smells. And I, I, I'm very disappointed that, that I mean, we are. I, we are. I, I don't, I, I don't uh, know who Jess Money is and, and I don't, I can't wish, I'm assuming it's a her, um, I wouldn't have wanted to go up in front of anyone to say anything about this whole shenanigans. But that statement does feel like just like they're saying, oh, it's fake news, people. Move on. That's essentially what they're saying. And that's It's probably just... on a rubber stamp somewhere. Yeah, it's yeah. just that. There we go. Just read that. It's, it's disappointing. Um, it is. But anyway, it is. We've, we've spent a lot of time on on those two. Uh, they were, what the, I was want to pick up one small thing, and it's, I just want to do it very quickly. We talked in our last, um, our last unpacking software, uh, podcast live stream. This is going to be a podcast as well, so you can uh, get that in your podcast manager of choice. But uh, we talked about Blue Sky um, and their approach to moderate uh, moderation, moderation, and how they were going to do it. Now they've actually published um, the, the, something called Ozone, um, and they're open source, and it's the collaboration, collaborative moderation tool. I cannot speak today. Um, and what I want to do is I want to pop that in the description of wherever you find this, because I just find the whole Blue, what Blue Sky are doing very interesting. Unfortunately, the platform doesn't have a lot of users. Uh, maybe that will grow, but I, regardless of that, I actually find what they're doing very interesting. Um, I don't know if anybody, any of you guys have seen anything about this, or we want to yeah. spend 30 seconds, a minute talking about it, but... Yeah, but I mean, um, just from from my perspective, um, you know, it's, it's, it is, they're doing this, uh, the open source of the moderation stuff, uh, I, I don't want to say, uh, no, no, definitely not too late, but at least um, it, it's coming after having opened up the platform to public signups and, you know, people being able to see the stuff without having authenticated uh, optionally, I should say that that is an option that you can toggle on or off on your profile. Um, so, you know, it's kind of well-timed from that perspective. And last night, I think they actually, or yesterday, because America, um, they, they did roll out the new version, um, which did include some user level moderation tools. That I think they go into in the same blog post um, that we're referencing here. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's really cool that they are they are adding stuff for this. Um, there has definitely been a lot of um, chat about the need for this sort of thing for a little while on the platform, mm. I think. Um, so it's good to see that they are stepping in. I mean, yeah. having having dug into it a little bit, I mean, it does it does sound interesting. You can kind of optionally log it, or subscribe. Maybe that's a better word. You can optionally subscribe to these uh, moderation rules and different levels. Mm. I think a lot of us who've grown up well in amongst twitter have kind of we've got our own we've got our own ban lists and muted words and all that sort of stuff that you can curate on your own based on what you're seeing whereas this ability to say okay i want to subscribe to this one and i want to subscribe to that one and by subscribe i mean essentially block you can you, you filter yeah. out all of the stuff that's in that 
uh, moderation channel. I think it's a very interesting idea. It, 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 it obviously, there is still an element of curation, but the curation is being done by a another person. And then, but then there's the, the trust element that goes with that. They have to build up trust within those uh, moderation channels. But yeah, the fact that it's all done in the open, the fact that it's part of the protocol, uh, I think is interesting. So uh, it's there, it's defined. You kind of know what to expect. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see where it goes. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I agree. I think it's uh, it, I, what what's interesting to me is uh, I kind of use Mastodon now, and I've started getting quite invested in Lemmy as well, which I quite was like a Reddit alternative. So having while they're, we're not talking about and they're not talking about using this tool, I just think it's interesting that perhaps they could adapt some of actually the tool, or maybe they could adapt some of the rules or yeah. something like that to maybe save the, save them from you know, starting from scratch. Why reinvent the wheel when somebody else has done it? Um, so that to me is quite interesting, um, and I, I, I hope it keeps going. I'm, I've got some reservations about Blue Sky and how where it's going to go. To be fair, um, I think they're they're too slow on the uptake, um, and I think the people that have left Twitter have all left, and I don't think they've gone to Blue Sky. And the people that are still, at, you know, on Twitter are the ones that are going to stay there. So I don't really know where Blue Sky fits in. Um, but anyway, I hope it. I do hope it succeeds. But um, the yeah, the moderation tools were were interesting. Um, Okay, um, so I, I want to pick up some of the security news that's happened over the last month as well, and then we'll just touch on a couple of things in Patch Tuesday. Patch Tuesday was quite, I guess there wasn't a lot going on, um, but I will pick up that for a couple of minutes, I think. But the, the first item in the security news I was want to talk about was Microsoft finally killing off um, 1024 bit TLS. Um, I, I, I don't really want to say too much about it other than it's about time. I understand that, you know, they have um, a lot of legacy systems to support i think with um their their support life cycle now being much stricter you know it's windows 10 it's windows 11 it's specific versions and they only keep them around for a while um whereas before it seemed to be everything in their dog but now they've, they're much stricter but still i just feel this is it, it, it's i'm glad it's come along but it, it should have i felt come along probably quite some time ago um yeah i mean yeah there's a lot of embedded systems that are probably going to be suffering from this, but frankly, they probably shouldn't be on the same networks as things that are being updated. So, um, yeah, you would kind of hope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've had some issues with uh, when we uh, rolled out TLS one point two onto the Chocolate Community Repository. I can't remember when we did that. It was two or three years ago, and um, we've still people to this day trying to connect with Windows Seven. Yeah. Um, now, Windows Seven is out of support, but also you have to manipulate it to get TLS one point two working. Um, and certain, uh, certain, certain, what do they call them? Is it certain algorithms that just won't work? Um, but yeah, it's, so this legacy stuff continues to just stay around forever. But yeah, I'm glad they've, they've finally decided that they're going to stop that. But um, yeah, um, it's, it seems to be a, uh, they should have done it some time ago. But the next one we're talking about, I think, um, being as I mentioned earlier on, we're all technical people. We probably all of us do some sort of coding or programming or scripting, whatever you want to call it. And we probably all have used or do use GitHub. Um, but over 12 million auth secrets and keys were leaked on GitHub in 2023. This was an article um, we, we found um, covered in Bleeping Computer. And I'm just trying to actually, I'm looking at our notes here. Um, I try to remember the name of the company and I don't think I've recorded it, but there was a company that does the, um, oh, it's SoFos. Um, SoFos are kind of scanning a lot of this stuff and they found that in 2023, um, the, the report they produced that compromised credentials were responsible for 50% of the attacks in the first half of the year. Um, I, I mean, Gary, is a GitHub star. Tell us, tell us more. How many were you? I mean, it's one of those, it's one of those things. I mean, I, mean I, 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 I'm, I've obviously never done it, but you, I think we can all appreciate and understand that maybe you're testing something locally. You put some information into a configuration file, or you've added a, a an API key somewhere, and it's coming to the end of the day, you just do a git commit and a git push and it ends up in your repository. I mean, but it's also frighteningly, it's frightening how quick a system running in the background somewhere can pick up on the fact that you've pushed that API key into a, a public repository and then immediately start using it. I mean, I've, I've read some horror stories of people waking up the next morning and they've run up a massive Azure bill because mm -hmm. someone's been doing something with the API key or credential that they've... they've... So it, it's definitely a problem. 
Um, there are things that you can do. There are protections within GitHub itself where you can uh, on push, um, you, can, you can enable push um, uh, protection so that GitHub, when you attempt that push, will look at the contents of that commit or commit that you're trying to push, and they'll make an informed decision about, oh, that looks very much like it's a, an API key or a, a something, and they'll, they'll physically stop the push from making it to the, the public repository. Now, there are obviously times when, well, you want to do that because the, the API key might be as part of your documentation because you want to document the usage of an API key and you've got an example API key. So you can you can put um, uh, kind of let it fly, let, let it go. Can I really want this to be in there? So there's all sorts of systems that you can do in and to make that possible. Um, but I mean, what it comes down to is it's, 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 the, it's the human factor at the end of the day. I mean, yeah. um, regardless of what systems that people put in place to try and protect you from this, it's the person at the keyboard that's going to got find a final responsibility for it. Um, and until we figure out how to make humans not silly, it's it's always going to happen. Um, but it is it's it is it's a scary amount of uh, people that have been suffered from this. And the article that linked to a very very small people number of people actually fixing the problem once it's been once it's been pointed out to them. Um, because I think the article suggested or talked about they went back and checked again after a period of time. And the API keys were still there and hadn't been rolled over and all that sort of stuff. So, mm. yeah, it's it's a problem that we're all going to have to deal with at some point. I think. Uh, obviously, I wouldn't do it because I I would never do it. But I mean, <laughs> I it, mean, it happens. It's definitely an argument against committing everything that's currently been changed in your folder without reading through it. I'd say. Correct. Um, I mean, there's there's obviously things you can do in terms of get ignore files, so you don't allow changes to certain files mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, like I said, we've all been there. End of the day, you want to do a quick commit just because oh, you're going on holiday. You want to just commit everything and yeah, work with it. Or work in progress commit, absolutely. Um, or end of day commit is, is uh, I've sometimes used in the past. Yeah. But I, you have to remember it's it's a public repository that everyone has access to. And like I say, because of these automated systems that are scanning for these things going in, they're so quick that they just have it and they're off with it and doing stuff with it. So yeah, yeah definitely a problem. So, Corey actually talking about it being very quick. Corey actually mentioned in, in the chat there, and I've just popped it on the screen um, that Corey Quinn was testing something, and AWS keys, AWS keys were compromised before he could even disable them in a the dashboard when he was doing yeah. it live. So, and I have yeah. I have read about in the past where there are just bots that sit and they just troll GitHub, yeah. um, and if you push it and they automatically pick it up, it's off, it's gone, it's been picked up by that point. So even if you think you're, oh no, I've, it's only been two minutes, I'll be, I can revert that commit, and, you know, and you, it disappears. It doesn't disappear. Somebody's got it, mm -hmm. a bottle of grabbed it, or or something else. So well, the yeah. problem with that is that because even though you revert the commit and you haven't got it in the 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 default branch now, it's still in the history. So if they really wanted to go and find it, they absolutely could. So when you're in that scenario, you actually have to use, I forget the name of the tools, Corey can probably remind me of them. Um, there are tools that can actually go through the history and remove all the offending commits and or the hunks of the commits that you want to, to be removed from. So you can essentially purge it from the entire history. But again, that's time, effort. Everyone would then have to reset their uh, clones because they're all out of sync. It's, it's not a pretty situation to end up in, but it obviously happens, so. Something else. So was... Pick. Sorry, James. On you go. Oh, I was just going to say, like uh, the the one nice thing I suppose is, um... oh, sorry. Well, two things actually. Uh, one fun thing uh, is that the same report actually breaks down. Um, kind of, they they tried to identify what kind of things were leaked, um, and um, a couple of my favorite things: Telegram bot API keys. Um, I'm happy to say that I don't think I've leaked mine, um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that that was that was high up there, uh, and uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the LLM. Um, API mm. keys have really seen an increase uh, for good reason because there yeah. are a lot of people playing with them um, and presumably going fast and breaking stuff. I think um, there are not examples of people using LLMs, whether it's ChatGPT, GitHub Copilot, whatever, when they've asked for an example of how to do things, they've actually provided a full example that's got a valid API key in it because they've learned it from the open GitHub repositories that have got all these things in it. <laughs> it's it's scary that they pick all that stuff up as well. There was only um, 1.8 million leaks, but they all happened six times. Um, 
Well, like, talking about that, actually, it says um, again in the, the, the article that it's been an increasing trend since 2020 when uh, it went from three to six and then 10 and now to 12 million. Mm. So it's it's jumped in the last four years from three million to 12 million. So it's become an increasing problem. And part of that, as it, as it mentioned, is these um, LL, LLM API keys. Because, as you said, James, everybody's now playing with that. It's now the big yeah. buzzword. It's now, you know, the thing to be doing. So people are going to start uh, accidentally committing those keys as well. So, so yeah, scary stuff. Yeah. James? Uh, it is, I, I will also just last, last, last thing, I swear. Um, it's also, you know, a fraction of the overall GitHub um, commits, repositories, et cetera. You know, I think there's... I think GitHub said in 2023 there were some 4.5 billion odd contributions. Okay, that's commits and probably issues and comments and everything. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's there's been a lot of stuff, and not everything's been a leak secret. So that's that's nice. Yeah, yeah. Think and and that you know, with those numbers, it's not a lot, but um, you know, in comparison to what there, yeah. there, there, there could be. But yeah, it's, 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 a lot. it's yeah, it's an increasing trend. Um, it's something that everybody needs to be aware of. Um, so we're running quite close to uh, the end of, of the time. No, not at all. The, the only, uh, there was one more thing I wanted to pick up on because um, it, it, again, was all over the news and I'm just really going to pass it over to James and it was the Team City vulnerabilities um, that, um, you know, were uh, fixed uh, with since yeah. the last live stream. Yeah, so, yeah, the, that was a, a bit of fun uh, in that, you know, the, there was a little bit of controversy and a little bit of uh, mild argument, to put it in a very British way, um, between Rapid7 and JetBrains, uh, where, you know, th there was a patch that happened and arguably disclosure didn't happen as fast as some might have liked it, or, or maybe not in the order that some people would have liked it. Um, so, you know, th there, was, there was a patch, it was released, and then uh, the people who'd found the exploit uh, released a bunch of information on that anyway, which, you know, you, you can definitely see arguments from both sides. Um, there, there was an argument against silent patching, which is a phrase I, I guess makes entirely a lot of sense, but I hadn't actually heard, I don't think. Maybe I had. Um, but, you know, the practice of releasing a patch that fixes a bunch of stuff, but you don't tell anybody about it, which, yeah, is is a little bit janky. If, if you don't tell somebody, hey, you should upgrade because this is, this is quite a bad exploit and, and we fixed it now, how are they going to know? Um, but yeah, it's it. It was a whole thing, um, and yeah, no, it, you, you're right. It, I think part of the problem is in weekend we talked about this earlier on. Was there's people picking sides? So Rapid Seven did a thing. JetBrains did a thing. We're not going to pick sides on here. Uh, we've both, you know, we've got opinions. We've talked about them earlier. There's other team members that've got opinions, um, but this is the only people that know what really went on. Um, other two, those two companies and the people that were involved. Um, so we're not picking sides in that. But the, I think the the whole end result of it was that um, JetBrains patched the exploits, and the actual proof of concept for the exploits was released in a matter of hours after the patch went out. I think that's a matter of fact. Um, and whatever side you sit on, you'll think that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but I think the the end result of that particular thing was is people have not patched their systems and there's not a proof of concept exploit out there and how yeah. to actually breach those systems. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So getting that patch is good. And I, actually, another phrase I heard recently was uh, one day patch, uh, one day exploits, um, which I guess is just the idea of hey, yeah. exploiting things that have been uh, you know not a zero day, but anything after that is a one day, but I guess only for a short amount of time. Um, but really, it reminded me, and this does sound like a say to our sponsor, um, of um, a post that Stevie, um, the chap who I think was on the last Unpacking Software um, thing, uh, did on LinkedIn uh, around basically generating a uh, deployment and um, getting that deployment pushed out to all vulnerable boxes via CCM uh, or Chocolatey Central Management um, not so long ago. He was very excited about that. He did it about 10 minutes, which is decent. Um, But that was for a completely different piece of software called ConnectWise Screen Connect. So, uh, not entirely. Yes, and I'm actually as I as I, the reason I was typing there is because I'm actually going to pop it onto the screen. Oh. Yeah. So you, somebody sing a song. Well, I'm that would be <laughs> useful because um, I'm not typing fast enough, unfortunately. I think for, for, uh, the the interesting thing for us internally, uh, I mean. I don't think it's a secret. We use some JetBrain software internally as well. So the 
our ops team were on the ball and we got the notification and we patched it. We were one of the ones that uh, were able to patch this uh, before any of this exploded controversy that came up out of it. But because what, what I will say is that within Team City, the ability to update uh, the software is re- in- re- incredibly good at what it does. Um, so it's, yeah. it's, it's trivial to get it updated. Um, but yeah, as, as uh, Paul posted there, that was the uh, the link to what Stevie did in terms of uh, if you if you have a vulnerability and you need to patch it quickly, this is one mechanism that you can use to to do that. Um, so it was a it was a really good video that you put together. Yeah, it, it, it's it's yeah. uh, good and simple. Just having a group of machines that have say Team City on and then being able to push that patch out would have been pretty darn easy. And do you know what? It didn't even take 10 minutes. It took 9 minutes and 59 seconds. So not even 10 minutes. <laughs> and you've got uh, everything up to date. Um, but I think the point of it is, is that, you know, the, there are tools out there that um, allow you to do uh, these things. We talked about Avanti last week as well. We're talking about, you know, and the, the, the patches that um, we'll talk about in the, the uh, Patch Tuesday part of it. And there's Adobe patches that have come out. There's some Exchange patches. You know, there's we've got these vulnerabilities coming out all the time. And what you need is a tool that you can quickly deploy um, software and upgrade software so that these one days, as we call them, or zero days, or whatever you want to call them, um, can actually be mitigated as quickly as possible. Um, you know, there are some times that you can't do that. There might be reasons for that. But for those platforms that you can do it with, you know, for example, using CCM, um, if you've got a test environment with um, uh, your uh, Team City software in there, but you've got a staging area, uh, you might have a QA area, you might have a production area, you can actually patch them in order and make sure that the patches are actually working properly. Oh, I've patched, I've patched QA, uh, sorry, I've patched staging. Um, okay, it's all working. Everything's great. We've run a build. Everything looks great. Right, let's move on to production. You can do that quite easily with CCM and be able to, um, you know, target your deployments to particular groups of those computers. So you can mitigate those problems quickly um, and make sure you don't get into a situation where you've got half your servers patched, half your servers not patched. These ones over here, I don't know what they're running because mm-hmm. um, we've got no information on them either. We don't know what software is installed. They would just know this team set you on it. We don't know the version. You know, Using something like Chocolate Central Management makes a lot of sense in that that situation. Um, so yeah, I've linked I've linked to that on the screen there, and as I mentioned, I've also popped it in the chat, um, and we'll link it in the description. Wherever you find this content, it'll also be in the description as well. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that that helps some people. So that helps the sysadmins out there who have to actually uh, patch some of this stuff. Um, yeah, sorry for. Yeah, I feel like I shouldn't have. This is the non, uh, not so chocolatey stream, so I maybe shouldn't have jumped in there. Sorry, <laughs> it's the not so chocolate stream. But again, we're we're trying to help people. You know, part of our mission is to be able to teach the um, you know the the, the simple um, parts of, of automation. And we're trying to help people. We're trying to make people's lives easier. We're trying to let people go home at night. Um, and not have to worry about that half the systems are now vulnerable because Team City um, has a, a vulnerability and that, that, you know, it's going to take them four days to patch everything manually and run around these machines with a floppy disk. I'm old. That's what we used to do. Um, or a CD. I'm, that, I'm still old. Um, or a USB stick. You know, you run around all these machines. You can do it uh, automatically. Um, and you can patch those, you know, those machines within a maintenance window as well. Fairly simply. If you know PowerShell, it's even better because... Uh, Chocolate Central Management is able to use advanced deployments and um, get those uh, PowerShell scripts out there as well, and doing various bits and pieces on your machines that you maybe want to to automate. And um, so it lets you go home at night, spend time with your family, and not have to worry about all this stuff going on um, in your organisation. So um, I think while we're we're talking about software, it's still useful to first system administrators to know what their options are out there. For sure. But, um, so we're, we're kind of right bang at time. Um, but I wanted to just pick up on Patch Tuesday really quickly. I'm not going to kind of go around anybody. I'm just going to kind of mention uh, there was 60 vulnerabilities patched in Hyper-V and Exchange Server um, on Patch Tuesday, which seems like quite a lot. There was two CVs in there. Um, Exchange Server just seems to be constantly getting hammered. It, it just seems to be a, an avenue for attack all the time. I used to be an Exchange admin many, 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 many years ago. Um and even back then, it was it, actually, it wasn't, I don't think it was actually um, attacks or patches that was a problem. I think it was using the software was a problem because <laughs> it was so complex. But um, yeah, Exchange is just a problem in general. Adobe, they had three, 13 patches last patch Tuesday. We got 46 
this this past Tuesday, which again seems like a lot to me, but you know. Um, and Cisco patched the high severity vulnerabilities in their VPN products. So that's maybe something that if you're using Cisco VPN, uh, go and have a look at that. Make sure uh, you're up to date and get that covered as well. So, um, yeah, not a lot to talk about there, but um, certainly some things that you should be uh, looking at if you've got that software installed. What we normally touch on is a little bit on events. We touched on this last month as well. So there's a PowerShell Global Summit, and that's in April the 8th to the 11th, um, and that's in Bellevue in Washington. Myself and James will be there, so pop by the chocolatey booth and you can say hi to us. Um yeah, we've also, we've got some giveaways. We'll have some, probably some, t I think we've got T-shirts. We have got T-shirts this time. Um, we've always got T-shirts, but I didn't know if we were definitely doing them. Um, and yeah, there's a full list of speakers on the website and schedules there as well. I'll be speaking. James, are you, you're speaking as well, aren't you? Yep, got an exciting yeah. talk. Yes, so a lot of the chocolate team are actually going to be there. So if you want to meet the chocolate team, a lot of us be there and most of us are speaking. So, uh, so there's that. Um, and that's in a couple of weeks, as I mentioned, 8th to the 11th of April. Well, there's a Red Hat Summit, May 6th to 9th. That's in Denver and Colorado. Uh, that's all things Red Hat, OpenShift, Ansible, all that good stuff. You know, DevOps or configuration management tools. That's the place to be. Uh, particularly Ansible, really like Ansible. Uh, then we've got Partial Conference in Europe. And that's in Antwerp in Belgium, the 24th to 27th of June. James and I are going to be there as well. Uh, but neither of us are speaking. So uh, you can pop by the booth again. Uh, sorry? Much quieter. Yes, much Yes. We'll just be seeing things rather than speaking about them. Um, so, yeah, pop by the booth there as well. well again, we'll have T-shirts and, and stickers and probably giveaways and, uh, yeah, all sorts of stuff uh, for that as well. So you can get that on, uh, the information on that at psconf.eu. Uh, as I mentioned, Pershell Global Summit, that is pershellsummit.org. And the Red Hat one is redhat.com, so you'll be able to find that as well. Uh, okay, uh, anything to pick up before we close, guys? We're quite a bit over time, but I think it was a useful discussion today. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think the Broadcall one in particular was very interesting. Um, we've got a lot to talk about. This is the thing we, you know, we talk about chocolatey a lot. We talk about, you know, chocolatey products and chocolatey things and how we can get things to work chocolate. We never really talk about the technical and the, the, the software part of that we're also really interested in. So this is why I find this very useful. We can have these conversations um, about these things. So yeah, it was useful. Um, but yeah, I, I asked you if you didn't to talk about it and then just proceeded to keep going. So if you, know, <laughs> you want to pick up before we close. Not from my side, no, I think I'm good. No? Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Gary and James, for joining us. Uh, we want to make sure that your content that we're producing is what you guys want to see. And as soon as I can move this thing, I'll be able to look at the screen. Yeah, so there we go. Uh, the content we're producing is what you want to see, what you want to hear. If you've got any ideas about what you'd like to see, please have your say at ch0.co slash stream survey, all one word. That link will be in the description of wherever you found this content. Please go on there. It will take you about, I think it's a, that, that one's about a 10 second survey. It's a couple of boxes to click um, and you can enter some text if you want about the kind of things you want to see. So there's not a lot in that if you want it to be really quick. Um, but if you want to be notified of upcoming chocolatey content, join the community hub on Discord, subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Twitter or X, Mastodon, LinkedIn, Facebook, Blue Sky and Twitch all the things we're on, and you can find all of those links on our homepage, chocolatey.org, at the bottom of the screen. Um, or, uh, sorry, not the bottom of the screen, bottom of the page, or in the description of wherever you found this content. Uh, our next live stream on Twitch or YouTube is on Thursday, the 4th of April. Uh, we're all going to be going back to basics again, and we're going to be looking at, uh, not for, is it the 4th of April? Yes, it is the 4th of April. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, what's chocolate. So if you kind of, you know, you've we've talked about chocolatey today. We've talked about, you know, chocolate central management. Um, but the, the, the package manager, chocolatey CLI, we'll be talking about that on the 4th of April, myself and Gary. And uh, come along to that if you're, you're curious uh, about what we've been talking about today. And uh, we'll go through that with you. Very straightforward, very step by step, back to basics. We're doing quite a few of these to kind of introduce uh, chocolate products and, and what we really do from, from the beginning. So, yeah, please join us there. But thank you for your time today. And as I said, thanks to Gary and James. And we'll see you guys hopefully on the next uh, live stream. When is our next live stream unpacking software? When will that be? Somebody quickly tell me. That will be uh, the 18th, 18th we'll of April. Future. 18th of April, we'll be doing the next one. So, yeah, hopefully join us. Uh, hopefully we'll see you then. And uh, take care. Bye-bye. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.